I had the great privilege last week of, of uh, doing a men's conference uh, for Living Waters Church and then preaching for their weekend services. And, uh, and, and so this morning I was kind of questioning, Lord, is this just some memory reflex? Because what they're going through in their, in their um, sermon series for this year is launching out into the deep based on Luke 5. And what the, what the Lord had led me to speak on last Sunday was, was a sermon I've preached here before about walking on the lake and, and uh, Jesus and, and uh, instructing the Apostle Peter to walk on, on water. But as I, as I sat and worshiped this morning, and, I, and, I, and I, I usually stand for the worship, but I sat because I, I felt the Lord quickening me to something, and I had to wrestle it a little bit uh, to make sure it wasn't just a memory and that it was something that's fresh for, for us today, and, and I, I pray that it is. But, but one of the things that, str that strikes me is, is the incredible humility of God. The incredible humility of God. C.S. Lewis talks about his conversion, uh, you know, raised an Anglican, becoming an, an agnostic and an atheist around uh, adolescence, and then coming back to the Lord uh, somewhere around his 30th birthday. And, and, um, and he talks about the fact that in, in, his, in his journey away from God and then back to God, he was, he was a very, very reluctant convert, almost, almost resistant, almost frustrated with the fact that that there could not be one place in the universe that was just his, just his to himself. And he said, when I finally came to the conclusion that, that, that God was real and that the claims of Christ were true, he said, I, it was almost as though I, w I was, I was a, a person coming into the room, da eyes darting back and forth, frustrated and almost, uh, almost upset that, that, I had to, that I had to surrender to him. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Lewis wrote much more eloquently than I'm stating. But what he said then, but, but it, it struck me of the divine humility that God would accept such a reluctant convert as I on those terms. And we sang about it today, and, and uh, Brother Larry read about it in, in the second chapter of the book of Philippians, where Paul says in verse 5, and, and it's not on your screen, I apologize, you're going to you're gonna have to keep old-fashioned notes today, we didn't help you, you're going to have to use a Bible today, wow, what a concept, but anyway. In Philippians 2.5, Paul says, let, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Theologically, it's the kenosis of Christ. We talked about it in the faculty meeting this week, as a matter of fact. But made himself nothing, emptied himself, taking on the very nature of a servant, and being found in likeness, human likeness, as a man, he became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He set aside what was rightfully his so that he could embrace you and me. And became obedient to death even the death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Paul, we, we love that passage because it gives us a framework of Jesus, but we need to be reminded of the very beginning of that little passage of Scripture. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. We, must, we, have a, we have a terrible tendency to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And by do, so doing, we end up thinking of ourselves less than we should because we just have an improper perspective. Well, in these two little passages, before we go to the Lord's table, I, I want to show you something about Jesus that, that, that moves my heart. And I, there is a little outline here if you're, if, if you're, if you're interested in, in it. And it's an outline of, of repurposing, refreshing, and releasing. Now that's the redemptive plan where God rescues us and restores us and releases us. But I want you to see it with, with the notion of boats. Now I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a sailor, as you know. And just in case you don't know, I hate seafood. Just putting that out there. If you invite me over for dinner, please don't have seafood. <laughs> okay. So I don't know a whole lot about these things. 
except what I read, and I, you know, I try to read quite a bit. But in Luke, the fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse, it says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw, he, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats. Everybody say, he got into the boat. The one belonging to Simon. Everybody say Simon. And we know him as the Apostle Peter. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and, and put down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. What a great line. What a reluctant guy. Uh, Lord, I'm the professional here. I know what I'm doing. See this boat you're in? I own this boat. It's my boat. I am a professional. You, by trade, on the other hand, are a carpenter. You can build the boat, but you can't sell the boat. I know what I'm doing. And we have been at this all night because that's when you're supposed to be at this all night. Not after somebody has been yelling in the boat and scaring off all the fish. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Everybody say amen. amen. A couple thoughts that I want to share with you. There is within the residue of our fallen nature a desire to control our pathway. There is within our lives and the residue of our fallen nature a desire, as Lewis talked about, to have some things in our life that are just ours. In fact, we have a tendency to so bifurcate the sacred from the secular that we almost have become uh, quite, quite pharisaical in our approach to Christ our, our Christian walk and our Christian faith. In other words, we have our secular stuff. This is the stuff we do on Sunday. This is the way we act on Sunday. This is the way we dress on Sunday. This is the way we behave when we're inside the sanctuary. And then over here, we can kind of do our own thing and go our own way and do our own stuff. And we've become, you know, for all of our criticisms of the, of the liturgical churches, in the Pentecostal movement, we've kind of become that way too. Where we just kind of do our stuff. And we always, you know, growing up, at least me growing up, the thing that we always spoke against the liturgical churches is, yeah, you live your life however you want all week, but then you go to a confession box and you're good to go. Well, we kind of do the same thing. Live our life however we want and then go to church on Sunday, say a few prayers, raise our hands, sing a little bit, get, get a good sermon, pump us up, and then we kind of go our own way. And what God does is he comes and he challenges us by taking the Christ of the church outside of the church. And so the Spirit of God comes along and he comes to you in your truck and in your car and in your job, and in your workplace, and in your school place. And he comes and he acts like he knows what he's doing there. He refuses to submit to your professionalism. He refuses to submit to your leading the place. 
and you're leading the line. Let's talk a little bit again about the Garden of Eden for just a moment, that great cataclysmic fall. Remember, God had yielded to Adam everything. Everything. Delegated authority, but it was real authority. Everything you can eat from that tree and that tree and that tree and that tree and that tree, but not that one. That one's mine. You can have all of this, but that's mine. Don't touch that. How many laws were in the garden? One. One. How many laws we got now? Millions. How many laws were in the garden? One. How many could they keep? None. One law. Because within us, and this is where the temptation comes, the temptation isn't wealth or pursuit of this or pursuit of that. All that stuff are, are, are the effects of temptation. The actual temptation is who's going to run your life? You call him Lord and Master, but do not do the things he says. Who's going to run your life? So the carpenter standing on the side of the shore is speaking and he's teaching and he sees two boats and he gets into the boat. And he tells the guy who's captain of the boat, Peter, Simon, go out a little bit. Now it creates an amplification place and, it, and more people can see him, he's more visible, but it also with the water it helps to amplify the volume and so it, it, it makes perfect sense. And up until that moment Simon Peter is happy to comply. He's not complaining about the fact that it's the end of a long work day, he's not complaining about the fact that it's the end of a long work night and that he's hungry and he's tired and all of that. He's obviously intrigued by what the Lord has and by what the Lord is doing and he's obviously intrigued by what the Lord is saying. But it's also true that, that, that he has some knowledge of Jesus already but he's also returned to his profession. He wants part of Jesus, but not all of Jesus. He wants Jesus in his boat talking about spiritual things, but he doesn't want Jesus in his boat telling him how to do his life. How many times do we want Jesus to come into our life and deal with the spiritual matters we face. We want him at our weddings, we want him at our funerals, we want him when we're in the hospital, we want him when we're, when we're you know, kind of in need, we want him when the rent's due, we want, you know, but we, we, want, we want that Jesus to show up at that moment, but we don't want the Jesus that governs. Put out into deep water. Let down the nets for a catch. Master. Master. Verse 5. Master. He had the title, right? How often have you done that? How often have I done that? How often have we called him Lord, Lord, Master? and then proceeded to tell him what to do. And then proceeded to tell him what we won't do. And then proceeded to tell him how he should do. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. <sighs> you can almost hear him. You can almost hear Peter huff right here. <sighs> but because you say so. I will let down the nets. So here's the first blank. Number one, it's not in your notes, but it's a blank you can fill in. When Jesus steps into your boat, the first thing he does is repurpose your life. When Jesus steps into your life, the first thing he's going to do is repurpose it. Now, 
you and I feel like it's a repurposing, but the point of the matter is that what God is doing is restoring you to what he intended from you, for you and from you in the very beginning. So what he does with the Apostle Peter and, the, and his buddies there, the Zebedee's boys, and what he, what he does with them is the first thing he does is he gets in the boat, and that's a fishing boat, but that's not his purpose first. His purpose first is a testimony boat. I'm going to step into this boat and I'm going to repurpose it. The first thing God does in your life and in my life is begin to repurpose us for eternal purposes. He repurposes us for things that are determined that we will do more than we have ever intended or thought our design was. In other words, you and I may look at yourself and we see all the limitations of what we are. This is a fishing boat. It's purposed for fishing. It goes on the water. It comes back on the water. It catches fish. This is what it's for. You may say of yourself, well, I am a truck driver, or I am a business owner, or I am this, or I am a teacher, or I am that. And you think that your whole purpose is defined by by what you know and God steps into your life and says no I have far more than what you have designed or what you have understood I'm going to make your life a testimony to my glory and to my honor and to my purposes I'm going to repurpose you now he didn't blow up the boat he could have he didn't cut up the boat he could have but what he did was he repurposed it and this is what God does in your life and in my life he takes the things you're familiar with and transforms them, transcends them into something you and I never thought God could do with them. Well, I'm just, how many times over the last 40 years have I had a just, well, I'm just, I'm just a mom. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Theodore Roosevelt's the one who talked about the importance of that, of motherhood. And what we need is, 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 is more moms who are pouring the life and character. Now, he was looking for good citizens into, into young men and young women. Or I'm just a dad. Or I'm just a, I'm just a carpenter. Or I'm just a janitor. Or I'm just a this. Or I'm just a that. Oh, my friends, would you please understand that you're not just a anything. You're a child of God. And God gave you design. And he gave you purpose and he puts you into that custodial position or he puts you in that president's position but he has his intentions for those things you thought it was one thing he's got something grand and glorious that you could never imagine it's going to repurpose you one I'm, I'm just a musician i'm just a singer how many times have i said i'm just a preacher hundreds thousands maybe not recognizing that none of us are just to anything. That the Lord has design and intention. Well, we're just a small school, or we're just a this, or we're just... Stop, 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 stop. When Jesus steps into your whatever it is, when he steps into your life, when he steps into your home, when he steps into your work, when he steps into your purpose, when he steps into you, he changes you to everything he called and chose you to be. You're not just a student. You're not just a teacher. You're not just a mom. You're not just a grandma. You're not just a anything. You're a child of the living God. Hallelujah. He purposed that you would be in that secular school district. He purposed that you would be in that job in Silicon Valley. He purposed that you would be digging that ditch on Oakland. So in, in Oakland, he purposed that you would be building that house or doing that work. He purposed that. Just look for the transcendent purpose. Don't think your life is yours. Paul told the Corinthian believers, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your mortal bodies. So when Jesus steps into your boat, he repurposes it. But he also refreshes it, number two. He didn't take the boat onto the land and try to make a wagon out of it. He could have. He is a carpenter. And if he so chose, then so be it. But he didn't take the boat onto the land. But he made it more fruitful. Let's go back to the garden again. 
Don't touch that. Oh, don't touch this? Yeah, don't touch that. Part of the curse on humanity was not work. Too many people think that work is a curse. No, 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 no. God gave work. Hallelujah. Work's a Christian ethic. Yes. Work brings dignity. Work brings prosperity. Work, work, work's a good thing, okay? Part of the fall was not work. Adam had authority and tended the garden before the fall. Okay? Part of the fall was hard, unfruitful, unfulfilling work. By the sweat of your brow, thorns and thistles. The fall did not produce work. The fall produced unproductive work that required more labor than fruit. Okay? You understanding that? But when God gets into the mix, he begins to restore that. So he looks, again, he steps into your boat, he steps into your life, and he wants to bring refreshment. He wants to bring blessing. He wants to bring fulfillment. He wants to bring purpose into your life. If you're a teacher, if you're in a, 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 a situation where you're a student right now, whether you're doing manual, manual work or whether you're doing executive work or whatever, the Lord wants your work to be fulfilling and effective and even prosperous, starting, though, with the fact that it's supposed to be a testimony. So all the glory goes to Him. It's not how smart you are, and it's not how strong you are, and it's not how this you are, and it's not how that you are. It's who's running the boat. And so the first thing he does is repurpose you so that you can be a living testimony and do more than you intended to do and more than you imagined you could. And then he begins to refresh. And he looks at Peter and he, look, and he says to Peter, cast out into the deep water and throw your nets down. Well, none of this made sense to Peter because it had been his boat. But, but Peter, for all the stuff, we kind of make fun of him a little bit and, and I, I'm the worst at that at times. He says, Master, because I relate to him. Master, well, you know, I've done this and that and the other. I've told God a hundred times times what I've done for him as though God didn't know. How many times have we stood up in testimony and talked about all that we did and then at the end, oh, and the Lord helped me. When you're the hero of your story, it's your story. And it's not supposed to be your story. It's supposed to be his story. Amen? And so Peter, okay, master, you know, we've worked hard. We, you know, it, it, this isn't one of my favorite lines. This isn't my first rodeo, you know. I mean, Peter, you know, this is what I do. It's not the first time, but okay, you know, I, I, you know, it's almost a little, and I don't know this for a fact, but it's almost, because, you know, when we get to heaven, we may ask the question, but it's almost as if Peter is sort of humoring the Lord a little bit. Okay, if you think so. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this, and we'll throw our nets down. And, and all of a sudden, you know the story. We just read it. He pulls up this incredible, incredible catch. So much so that that boat whose purpose was to bring in fish couldn't bring in all the fish. And he has to yell, hey, James, John. And they have to come over. And the hole is so great. Now, how much money did they make that day? They did okay that day. Because that wasn't, you know, that's not fishing for limit for themselves. They're commercial fishermen. These are, this is their profession. This is what they do. And Peter brings that up. And all of a sudden, and, and James and John, and they're all, they're all bringing up this great catch. And they, and they get back, and, and, and they have this incredible moment where they realize that, that that one who's talking about eternal things is concerned about practical things as well. And that one who's repurposing you for transcendent grace is also dealing with your daily need and your daily bread. He's the God of the heavens, but he's the God who who knows your daily concern and your daily life. And all of a sudden it dawns on Peter that this guy here, who not only spoke a great teacher, but he talks to fish. He can get fish to swim into nets. Amen? Amen. How many times... Guys, it's real basic. 
Who causes the sun to shine? Who causes the rain to fall? Who causes the seed to grow? Who causes the soil to be fertile? Who causes these things? The God of the heavens and the earth, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Who is the one who brings prosperity into your life? Who is the one who brings blessing into your life that you can be a blessing? So much so that you can't contain a lavish blessing. That lavish blessing, they don't, the beauty of fish in those days is you didn't go store fish in the storehouse because it would rot. You had to sell it and get it out. You had to be a blessing to others. You had to be a blessing to the community. When God prospers you and blesses you, it's so that you will be a blessing to others. And he brings that into your life. He refreshes you. Not so you can go, wow, what a spiritual guy I am. I really prayed and that came to pass. No, no, no. God's merciful and God's gracious. And if you'll do a little obedience, even as Lewis talked about, a reluctant convert, he will still bless you in ways that you couldn't begin to imagine, but you got to take that blessing and give it out. Refresh others. Refresh the ones who don't own a fishing boat. Refresh the ones who don't go out to the lake. Refresh the ones who can't get what you've got. Refresh others and be a blessing to others. This is God's calling in your heart and in your life. He refreshes you so that you can be a blessing to others. But then it dawns on Peter that this is the same guy. Talks to fish. And Peter has an epiphany. And that epiphany is that you're a lot more than a carpenter. And you're a lot more than a rabbi. And you're a lot more than a teacher. And you're a lot more than even a miracle worker. And I have no business hanging out with you. I'm a wicked man. See, when the Lord truly repurposes and refreshes your life, you will have an epiphany of where you are without him. And that's all he's looking for. He's not looking for self-deprecation. Humility is not self-deprecation. Humility is self-realization. It is an awareness of who we are without him. And Peter says, Lord, you, you need to... You don't belong in my boat. I'm a wicked guy. I say things I shouldn't say. I think things I shouldn't think. I do things I shouldn't do. Just take your fish and go, you know. And Jesus looks at him. And I don't know what his eyes must have looked like to Peter, if Peter even saw him, because he may have been just... But Jesus looks at him, and he speaks to him with such tenderness and such mercy. And he repurposes and refreshes his life. A moment of invite becomes a lifetime of destiny. A moment of obedience where he just said, okay, Lord, I'll do this because you said so, becomes a lifetime of refreshment. Not easy, but a lifetime in which the Apostle Peter becomes the leader of the church. And he says to Peter in verse number 10, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. You'll catch men. And you know what, Peter? You're going to be effective at it. You're going to be fulfilling in it. 
I'm going to repurpose your entire life. This moment becomes a microcosm of what you're going to be. You let me into your boat and I'll repurpose everything that you are and I will give you fisher, you'll become a fishers of men. I will give you fruitfulness. I will give you effectiveness. I will give you fulfillment. You will live your life to the fullest extent because you're living exactly as I intended you to live. I know what you are. I know what you are. He, de he doesn't deny. When Peter says, away from me, Lord, I'm a wicked man. Uh, P Jesus says, oh, no, Pete, you're a good guy. <laughs> Amen? That's, that's kind of our answer. When someone says how terrible we are, we always go, oh, no, no. When in, back here somewhere, we're going, yeah, you're, you're kind of worse than that, but okay. <laughs> Jesus doesn't deny who Peter is without him. That's not the focus. The focus isn't on your failure. The focus isn't on who you are without him. The focus is on who you are with him. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So go with me quick to Matthew 14, because I want to I wanna wrap this up, but I, I want to show you something. Okay. So Matthew 14, if you're in Luke, you go back two books to the left. Since some of you have not used a Bible in years, you're using your phone. I wish I had time this morning to talk about the feeding of the multitude, but we don't. But another fish story. Five loaves and two fish, 12 baskets. So two fish get split 12 ways. So somebody gets a fish head and a piece of bread and says, go feed those 50 people. <laughs> okay. And they come back and they're fed and they're multiplied and, and the, the miracle takes place. So, uh, Matthew 14, we're going to start in the 23rd verse. Okay. So, after the feeding of the 5,000, I'm sorry, 22nd verse. So, after the feeding of the 5,000, the Bible says that immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side when he dismissed the crowd. Now, everybody say this, Jesus made them do it. I'm going to have you try that again. Say it with me. Jesus made them do it. We're having problems today. <laughs> One, two, three. Jesus made them do it. Very good. Suddenly I felt like I knew what some of our faculty goes through. All right, verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. When the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Walking on the lake. Not by the lake. Not around the lake. Not to the lake. On the lake. I'm not going to develop this. I have a sermon, and maybe the Lord will have me share it with you again. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Isn't it fascinating how we can believe that the enemy can do stuff, but we don't believe the Lord can do stuff? They had a great paradigm that Satan or a ghost or something else could do that, but not God. Get back to my point about spiritual warfare. We try to avoid spiritual warfare so much so that we don't do anything for God. Because the enemy's not going to fight somebody who's sitting down polishing his armor. There's no point. Why waste the resources? And we so try to avoid the darkness, we so try to avoid Satan, we so try to avoid the politicians, we so try to avoid the, the city, we so try to avoid this, that, and the other, that we forget that God is the God who can talk to fish. They cried out in fear, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Oh, when did he last, when did we just read, didn't we just read that he said, don't be afraid? Didn't we just read that in Luke 5? See, whenever the Lord shows up and He speaks, He brings His presence, He brings His promise, and He brings His possibility. 
When the Lord shows up, He brings His presence, His promise, and His possibility. So here, here we got this story again. Let's, I'll just, I, I'm watching the clock, and I want to go to His table, and I want to give ample time for that. So, but, I, but I need you to get this. So in Luke 5, we have the Lord coming into the Apostle Peter's boat, and he steps into the boat. Everybody say, he stepped into the boat. And he repurposed the boat. He refreshed the boat. He refreshed the, the purpose. He, 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 he brought more than was enough. Now, in Matthew 14, he sends the disciples away after this miraculous feeding of the multitude. He sends them away, and they, they, they don't have an easy time. Mark says that they strain at the oars. Matthew says that they're buffeted by the winds. It's the middle of the night. The fourth watch is three to six in the morning. And they're not getting much progress. They haven't made it all the way across. These are guys who are familiar with the, with the lake. They're familiar with the water. They're familiar with how boats work. Remember, we talked about that. They're the professionals. And they still can't get where they're going. And they're out there in the middle of the water, in the middle of the lake, because Jesus told them to go there in the middle of the water, in the middle of the lake. How many times have you been doing exactly what God told you to do, and you find wind and, sail, or wind and waves buffeting against you? It's tiring. It seems dark. You seem obscure. And you think, oh, God's not in this. No, God's exactly in it. And you start cursing the devil, and the devil's going, what, me? I, I, I had nothing to do with that. God is in it. Amen. God puts you in the middle of a battle. How many, let's put it another way, how many of you want to see a miracle in your life? Okay, you realize that to have miracles, you have to have really big problems. A 2% COLA adjustment, cost of living adjustment, a 2% raise on your paycheck at the end of the fiscal year is not a miracle. It's business. But when you lose your job today and gain a new job right before the last penny goes out the door, that can be a miracle. So let me ask you again. How many of you want miracles in your life? How many of you are willing for God to tackle the big problems? Okay, you see, you see where we're at? Okay, so they're straining, they're out there, they're in the middle of the lake, they're doing what Jesus told them to do, because Jesus had something to show them. He wanted to show them that not only does he talk to fish, but he walks on water. They have no paradigm for this. This is a new miracle. This is a miracle they've never seen. There is no other example of Jesus walking on the water. He just kind of did this that night. You know, go, you know, some people walk around the lake. Some people walk, you know, they find it comforting and colorful and peaceful and all that. Jesus gets his kicks out of walking on water, okay? So he goes walking on the water, and, and he's moving so well. Now, mind you, these are fishermen straining at the oar. They can't get across the lake. Jesus apparently can walk really fast on water. In fact, one, one, one rendering says he was about to pass them by. I mean, is he, is, he, is he jogging? Is he running? I mean, the Lord just kind of cruising on the water. And there are the guys, and they don't know it's him, and they get frightened. Ah, it's a ghost. It's Casper, or whatever, you know. <laughs> Have you ever startled somebody in the house you live in? It's your house, it's their house. But they act like you don't live there. You come around the corner, ah, and what do you do after you laugh and mock them? What do you do? It's okay. It's, it's me. It's me. Oh, you scared me. How? Well, this is almost like the Lord here. Well, how did I scare you? It's me. It's I. Don't be afraid. Peter. We're running out of time, so you guys just follow along, okay? Peter, not the other 11. Peter, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out there to you. <laughs> Sometimes Peter wasn't always the brightest bulb in the shed, okay, or in the, in the pack. And here's what I mean by that. If you really think it's a ghost, why are you asking the ghost to tell you to come out there? Okay, but at least he was courageous enough to talk. 
Thomas, Thomas is trying to figure it out. Yeah, I don't know what this is, but I'm not talking to that, okay? <laughs> Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And we know the story. And this story is not about Peter's failure. Because there are 11 other guys in the boat, I remind you, who didn't have the courage to get out and walk. And Peter gets out, sets his foot, and that water is as solid as this floor. And Peter the fisherman realizes this is not something that happens. And he begins to walk to the Lord. And at some point, it dawns on him, the professional that he is, that he can't do this. He knows water. He knows why we need boats. He knows all of this stuff. It's like the accountant praying for a miracle financially. It's harder for them sometimes, I think, than it is for others because they, they know how money works. Or it's like the doctor praying for the healing. It's harder for him sometimes because he knows how it works. And in whatever your role is in life, whatever your boat is in life, it's harder for you sometimes to expect the miracle there because you know how stuff works in that area. And so Peter realizes, I can't do this. And the moment he realizes his knowledge more than the Lord's promise, he begins to sink. And the Bible says that he knew who to call on as he began to sink. He immediately cried out, Lord, help me. Amen. Okay, so, you know, let's give him credit. And the Lord helps him, reaches him, and then begins to teach him right then and right there. Why are you so little faith? You know, they're standing out there on the water. I'd have been like, Lord, can we have this conversation in the boat? We'll go find a whiteboard and everything. You can talk it through. But here's the story, and this is what I want you to see. Peter walked on the water twice. He walked out to Jesus, and then he walked back with Jesus. And the Bible says they got back in the boat together. Now, other than Jesus, Peter's the only guy who's ever walked on the water, and he didn't walk on it once, he walked on it twice. Your failure and my failure does not preclude God from using you in the miraculous. It doesn't matter how many times you failed God, the miraculous will still come to pass in your life. It doesn't matter how many times you doubted God. It doesn't matter how many times you blew it. It doesn't matter how many times you said, I can't do this. He will meet you where you are, rescue you where you are, and lead you back to where he called you to be. But that's not even the whole message for today. The message for today is this. God will repurpose your boat. He will refresh it. But understand that the minute you invited Jesus into your boat, he's going to invite you out of it. He's going to release you from the confines of what you've intended your life to be. It is a repurposing, a refreshing, and a releasing. Nobody should ever walk on water. But God called Peter to walk on water. And you know what? There is nothing in the text that precludes the other 11 from asking for the same thing. They all watched the miracle. There's nothing that says they couldn't have participated in it. I believe it was God's will that all of them get out of the uh, and walk on the water. I think they all could have gotten back to the shore and left the boat in the middle of the lake. They could have had a little party out there at three in the morning. God is unlimited, but He sovereignly limits Himself to your activity of faith.
Abraham and the Lord had a conversation about Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there are 50 righteous? I'll spare it. How about 40? Okay. How about 30? Okay. How about 20? Okay. How about 10? Sure. God didn't stop till Abraham stopped. You say, well, God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I think Nineveh was just as bad. And God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. Billy Graham famously said one time that if God doesn't judge the United States of America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And we all kind of shake our head and go, yeah, yeah, what a wit. You don't understand. The heart of God's mercy. The heart of God is for us to get out of this boat of safety right here that we're in. Let God repurpose us. We're not just a worship institution. We're not just an educational institution. We're not the professionals. He has something bigger for this campus yes. than we've imagined. This has become our boat of safety. And when the Lord wants to do something different, we kind of look at him like, all right, but you know, we've been doing this 75 years, Lord. How about you let me do something you've never imagined? And I'll refresh all of this. Now listen to me carefully. I don't say what I'm about to say very often. This is a word from the Lord. You need to receive this. Okay? The Lord wants to repurpose, refresh, and release us. He wants us to walk on the water and step out there. What was the great purpose in walking on water? The great purpose in walking on water is to know that Jesus can do anything. There are no limits. There wasn't a great catch of fish that night. There wasn't a great harvest of souls that night. That was a miracle for Peter and the 11, the other 11. So they would know. Years later, when Thomas is preaching in Kerala, on the shores of India. And when Peter is hanging upside down, being crucified, and when others are being filleted, and others are being strewn apart, and others are being defeated and beaten for the sake of the gospel, they might hearken back to that night, to the one who called them out on the water, and said, don't be afraid, it is me. I'm with you. Wherever you go, I'll be with you. Isn't that what he said? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and wherever you go, most assuredly, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is a word from the Lord. Let Him repurpose all that you've intended because He has more than you've designed. Let Him refresh and make you more fruitful than you imagined you can be. And let him release you into places you never thought you could go. This is a word for many of you. This is a word for us. Don't be the professional here. Don't be the professional. Let us in humility say, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed here.